1650, the first major group of Scots arrived in the New World. They arrived, most notably, in Massachusetts Bay, transported, in fact, by a New England-built ship called the Unity. But others were scattered around English colonies which were loyal, or at least in safe submission, to Cromwell's new government. In the next couple of episodes, we're going to talk about who these people were, the Scotland they came from, and how they actually ended up in America while laying the foundation for Scotland's entry into our story as a continued force in American history. You're listening to Rejects and Revolutionaries with Sarah Tinsolvola, a podcast tracing the origins of America from the Tudor era to the 20th century. We haven't talked much about Scotland yet, and that's because Scotland really hasn't been a major player in American colonization up to this point. The Duke of Stirling had certainly expressed an interest in the New World, had gotten a grant of land in what's now Canada and named it Nova Scotia, but he'd never actually gotten a colony up and running there. And that was really the extent of it. Scotland and England were different countries with different cultures and quite a bit of a geographic barrier at this point in time. So Scots hadn't really participated in the English ventures we've been discussing. Scotland was also much poorer, much more sparsely populated, and much more religiously united than England. So there was neither the financial ability nor the acuteness of some of the driving forces behind English movement to America. Scots did lead some colonization-type projects under James I, projects which some English people from the border areas also participated in, but those took them to Ireland. Specifically, parts of Northern Ireland, which which were a mere three-hour boat ride from Scotland and which had been devastated in the Irish Wars that we discussed in our very second episode ever under Queen Elizabeth I, namely Ulster and a few other places, but mainly Ulster and not to America. That was about to change, though. Not right away, but in addition to these and subsequent transported POWs, thousands of Scots would go to America in the future thanks to forces created or exacerbated by this war. We're talking about a United States in which 18% of the population today has some Scottish ancestry and a Canada in which 13% does. And like so many things, it all really starts here, with the execution of King Charles I. But to start the discussion, we're going to head back a few years, and up to the mountains and isles of the Western Highlands, to one of the most famous, most notorious most violent and most tragic clan rivalries in Scottish history. This was a whole different world from the English towns and countrysides that would have been so familiar to our colonists. Life here was harsh, in some ways almost unbelievably so. Food was scarcer, winters were colder, and shocking acts of violence were still a thing. It was a place where clans and the kinship connections they formed were still the basis of society, and where feuds and rivalries among clans were still going strong. Massacres and revenge massacres happened. I'm not going to say that they happened every day, but they did happen. Now the good to this is that they did avoid a lot of the manipulative bureaucratic politicking that had started to take root other places, all the 
ugliness of the modern age, which we've started to see so much of in our story, well, it wasn't quite as real out here. Most people were living on self-sufficient little farms, rarely pulled into external conflicts. So that's the flip side. And in this place, there were two clans, the Campbells and the McDonald's. These were the two biggest clans in Scotland, and they neighbored each other. And more than that, for hundreds of years, the two had been standard bearers for opposing movements. The McDonald's represented tradition, while the Campbells stood for progress. The McDonald's wanted to be left alone, while the Campbells strove to be front and center. The McDonald's sought autonomy from Edinburgh and the Stuart Kings, while the Campbells worked to expand and solidify that very power. And when the Reformation happened, the McDonald's remained largely Catholic, though diverse and divided in belief, while the Campbells became leaders of the Presbyterian cause. The McDonald's were in the Highlands and the Outer Isles, while the Campbells were in the areas which bordered the Lowlands. The McDonald's would oppose each other, whereas the Campbells put up an almost unshakably united front. Not quite, but almost. The McDonald's were isolated, while the Campbells were at court. Potato, potato, sword, pen, sandwich, soup. These tensions had been building not just since the Reformation, but since Scotland had first won independence under Robert the Bruce. The Reformation had, of course, changed things, though. Unlike England, in which it had been very much a top-down thing imposed by a series of monarchs on their people, the Scottish Reformation had been a bit more organic, with Catholic monarchs and some Highlanders as the last remaining holdouts against encroaching Protestantism. And unlike England, in which the monarchs had diligently and violently forged a middle path between Catholicism and extreme Protestantism, Scotland had moved directly toward Presbyterianism against its monarch's wishes. There were lots and lots of external factors which helped cause this, which I'm not going to go into here, but ultimately Scotland was almost exclusively Presbyterian, with some Catholics holding on to their faith in Aberdeen and the Highlands. Persecution of Catholics absolutely happened in Scotland, as did the seizure of church lands and destruction of Catholic places of worship. And just like in England, this lessened toward the end of King James's reign, and during the reign of King Charles I. And as part of all of this, the Catholic McDonald's found their prestige waning even further, while that of the Campbells continued to rise. Even when the 7th Earl of Argyll became Catholic, he navigated the transition in a way that preserved his clan's holdings. Where just a few decades before, the McDonald's had been easily the biggest, most powerful clan, with the Campbells a clear second, That was now reversed. McDonald's found themselves excluded from politics, and Campbell's filled that vacuum. McDonald's rebelled, and after their defeat, the Campbell's were given the land that was confiscated. McDonald's land was also confiscated due to their unwillingness to conform to the Scottish Kirk, and yet again, it tended to be the Campbell's who profited. There's another Jacobian era project which saw the two clans take different sides. And that was Ireland. Macdonald's presence there went back to the 14th century as the Catholic Lords of Antrim. In contrast, Campbell's presence there 
was inextricably linked with the new Protestant Ulster Plantation. In fact, more Campbells migrated to Ulster than members of any other clan. The Ulster Plantation, which I mentioned before, deserves a bit more discussion. Partially, that's because it does factor into the conflict that we're discussing right now, but more to the point of this podcast, it's because any time that you hear somebody referring to the Scots-Irish or being Scots-Irish, it means that they trace their roots back to the Ulster and similar plantations. And yes, like I said, plantations as in colonies. It had started, like I said, with this Elizabethan era war. The Irish rebelled, and over the course of almost a decade, the consequences of that rebellion included either dispossession of lands or absolute destruction. I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but if you want some great background on Irish history, I would highly suggest you check out the most excellent History of Maryland podcast. During the war, some of England's most Puritan subjects started heading to the southwest of Ireland, the region of Munster, to settle and push Ireland Protestant. But the last place to hold out in the fight against England was the region of Ulster. And it wasn't subdued until about the time that James took the English throne. Ulster is extremely close to and historically connected with Scotland. There are six counties there, the northeastern most one being Antrim. And after the wars, Ulster was devastated, and I mean devastated. It was a ruin with huge numbers of people, especially leaders, dead or in exile, and it was just a very beaten down place with a beaten down people who were barely surviving, much less thinking of picking up arms. Yet. The fact that Ulster was suppressed around the time that King James took the English throne enabled Ulster colonization to be a primarily Scottish venture mostly people living on either side of the English-Scottish border. These people could get better land and better, longer rents there than they could in Scotland, and they could also spread their Protestant faith in the Catholic Ireland. King James encouraged this because it would help prevent Ulster from re-emerging as a center of resistance to English rule. By the 1630s, though, the devastation of the Elizabethan era wars had started to subside, and a new normal had emerged with the Irish very much living as second-class citizens, especially in Ulster. The loss of land to English and Scottish Protestants now happened in a less violent, more bureaucratic way, and power was shifting ever more away from the local Catholic lords under the direction of Thomas Wentworth, the Earl of Strafford. So as we head into the 1630s, we have a Scotland dominated by Presbyterianism. We've got a handful of people who have been encouraged by King James to embrace, at least weekly, an Episcopalian church model, along with a larger handful of Catholics who are absolutely devoted to their faith. Just a few miles away, literally within view on a sunny day, we've got an Ireland in which local Catholics have been conquered and colonized by Puritans from England and Scotland. And now we need to head down to Edinburgh for a few minutes to discuss some severely important things that were going on there. Unlike the Highlands, Lowland Scotland would have been quite recognizable to a 17th century Englishman. Poor, yes. Rougher, yes. More Presbyterian, most assuredly. But fundamentally, it was at least familiar. King James had died, Charles had taken the throne, 
and much like in England, problems quickly rose to the surface. James had negotiated concessions, but didn't live long enough to actually enforce his new policies. And now it was up to Charles to do that and more. A couple blunders, some convenient misunderstandings, and Charles is being just a bit too openly devoted to Arminianism meant that Scotland was soon almost united in opposition to its new sovereign. When, in 1633, King Charles met with the Scottish Parliament to get James's five articles ratified, he took his demands several steps beyond what his father had negotiated for and insisted that Scotland's ministers also wear the surplus and that they use an Anglican-inspired style of worship, which had been designed by King James, but which King James had strategically held off in implementing. And then he added a couple more demands. A new prayer book inspired by the English one, and a new book of canons. And just as the icing on the cake, Scotland had also been hit hard by a series of bad harvests, So everyone was already on edge, and they definitely resented the king's taxes. On his side, well, there weren't many people. The bishops were mostly kind of weak. With relatively few exceptions, the people who had adopted Episcopalianism weren't passionately extolling its virtues. Scots tended to be either passionately Catholic or, more commonly, passionately Presbyterian, but there wasn't much room for the sort of middling compromise that had come to define England's system. The very monarch-centric structure of nobles had been devastated by Henry VIII at the battles of Flood and Field and Solway Moss, so that wasn't a source of support he could count on either, And Scots definitely held the king to be divinely appointed, but their loyalty to their denomination tended to trump those feelings. So, all in all, Charles didn't have the best set of cards to work with in Scotland, and he also didn't play them particularly well. And for the next few years, he worked to create the standards to be used at Scottish church services, while his opponents also organized. On July 23rd, 1637, Charles's new style of worship was used for the first time in Scotland, and it went about as well as you'd expect. At St. Giles's Cathedral in Edinburgh, a woman named Jenny Geddes famously threw her chair at the minister's head while he started to preach, shouting, The devil cause you colic, false thief. Dare you say the mass in my ear? Then, more women threw their chairs. And men. And pretty soon there was a full-scale riot. Glasgow was rioting too, and other cities soon followed suit. Within a few days, a group of people, including Archibald Campbell, the Earl of Argyll, unveiled a document called the Covenant, which people could sign agreeing to stand together and do what it took to defend the Presbyterian Kirk. It was a meticulously reserved document, emphasizing its signatory's loyalty to the king, and it started a movement known as the Covenanters, which Scots rushed to join. Argyll had taken over leadership of the Campbells after his father's conversion to Catholicism had caused one of the very few schisms or scandals to impact that clan. And that's actually kind of a funny story. His father had gone, at the king's behest, to help put down a Catholic uprising near Aberdeen. He'd been defeated, and somewhere along the line he had converted. He was married actually, to a Cornwallis, who would have been related to our Maryland colonists, so I'm not sure if that had anything to do with it. He transferred his property to his son, sailed to the Netherlands, and from there announced that he was now a Catholic. He was promptly declared a traitor, 
And even when he was allowed to return to Scotland, he headed to London, where he lived at Charles's court for the rest of his life. So navigating that situation had given his son some political chops. And now he emerged as the leader of the Covenanters. On the other side, Charles appointed James Hamilton, Duke of Hamilton, to be his chief representative in Scotland. Hamilton was a Presbyterian, but he had spent most of his life in England, and his father had helped draft the Five Articles. Hamilton quickly lost complete control of Scotland. So quickly, in fact, that rumors started circulating that he wasn't just inept, but actively helping to encourage the riots. From here, the story sounds all too familiar. The Covenanters dominated politics, overwhelming and outmaneuvering not only the royalists, but the moderates who could have shifted the outcome to a less volatile one. It was these moderates who had enabled King James's successes, but the Covenanters now had control and they didn't let go. They rolled back everything Charles or James had done, and they pretty much put themselves in permanent control of Scotland and left the king to challenge it. They called their own parliament, established their own standing councils, and put in place procedures which they could control. Then they declared anything that went against their religious traditions to be against the very will of God, in a direct attempt to strengthen the position of Puritans in England. At this point, there wasn't much that Charles could do apart from stopping them by force, but Hamilton pushed for compromise and negotiation. And Charles went along with Hamilton's ideas for a while, backing down on everything, but to no avail. His bishops were virtually silent, and his Catholic supporters were immensely frustrated by his stalling, and in their perception, allowing what should have been a manageable problem to spiral out of control. War came and went, and came again and went again. The king's supporters were intimidated until they either agreed to Covenanter demands or fled to England. The Covenanters won, but continued building their army and attacking the remaining pockets of royalist support in Scotland. Anyone who refused to actively subscribe to the Covenant. Catholics were persecuted worse than ever. If they refused to attend an established church, 40 to 60 soldiers turned up at their house, drove away their cattle, took their furniture, confiscated their land, banished and imprisoned them more often than not in the middle of winter. Rumors spread that Protestant midwives were killing Catholic babies and even mothers. There were public floggings, Catholics couldn't be employed, and if they were, they had to be fired immediately. Episcopalians were treated similarly, but without anywhere near the same level of intensity. The citizens of Aberdeen were forced to sign the covenant en masse, and Argyll went through the lands of clans opposed to the covenant, largely Campbell rivals, and burned their strongholds. This was by no means exclusive to the McDonald's, but it very notably did include them. Most notably, Argyll took the majority of one Catholic MacDonald family prisoner, with the exception of one young son named Alistair McCullough, who managed to escape to Ireland and live with his relatives in Antrim. The king could do nothing about any of this, and the Covenanters continued to push and whittle until he was no more than a figurehead. They even imposed their own taxes to fund a standing army. For his part, Charles distributed honors among his enemies, making Campbell the Marquess of Argyll and Leslie the Earl of Leven. 
After his defeat in two wars, he had little choice, and now he had bigger problems to worry about in England. The one thing he wouldn't and couldn't back down on was agreeing that anything apart from Puritanism was against the will of God. But Argyll and his supporters wouldn't stop until he did. Watching all of this play out, though, was a Covenanter commander named James Graham, now Marquis of Montrose. Montrose is one of the most romanticized figures in Scottish history, and with reason. He was from one of the noblest Scottish families, a 30-year-old Presbyterian soldier and poet who had studied, among other places, at the French Military Academy at Algiers. He had fought for the Covenanters in both wars, but a About a year before, he had decided that Argyle and his supporters, as well as Hamilton, were not to be trusted. At best, Argyle was way too radical, and at worst, he was planning to gut the king's power so that he could become the de facto leader of Scotland. So, during the Second Bishop's War, Montrose had backed off and been notably, even suspiciously, more lenient than the rest of the Covenanter army. He was so suspiciously lenient, in fact, that at one point Argyle brought an army to occupy a castle that Montrose was already occupying. In 1640, Montrose and his little group of supporters met and formed the Cumbernauld Bond, agreeing to defend the covenant against Argyle and his supporters. One interesting note in the document was the accusation that religion was often used by rebellious subjects as a pretext for resisting a sovereign, when in fact it was the ends of ambitious men which were being serviced. Montrose was devoutly Presbyterian, but he supported both king and covenant. And now that the king had backed off on his proposed changes, Montrose saw no reason to continue to advance the cause of Argyle's power. This was a secret agreement that didn't come to much except for that when it was discovered, Montrose was pushed farther and farther to the side of covenant or politics. But it was a sign of the state of Scottish politics. Argyle was almost impossible to challenge. Hamilton was almost impossibly weak. And though there were some people who questioned all of this, they couldn't really do much about it. So when an unrelated man came forward, making claims about Argyle's push for personal power and reporting things that he had said, which seemed to substantiate those claims, that man was arrested and kept in jail until he changed his story. Just a few weeks later, Montrose and his allies were arrested and imprisoned because they had corresponded with the king. Dedicated royalists shared Montrose's suspicions, and one even challenged Hamilton to a duel for betraying the king's side. Hamilton had been secretly meeting with Argyle, and an engagement between his daughter and Argyle's heir had just been announced. And a group of Covenanters even plotted to abduct and kill Argyle, Hamilton, and another member of Argyle's group named Lanark. And when that failed, the still-imprisoned Montrose and King Charles were both implicated in the plot. Again, nothing came of that, but this was the political environment in Scotland as the outbreak of war in England approached. And we'll discuss that next episode.